them if you want to make those out to you. <laughs> Not coming through. No. There was a green line a moment ago. Now <laughs> there's no green line. So I'll keep talking and work on it. Just a second. But uh, so those kids are going to have uh, coupon books. And if you can convince them to make those out to you, good job. But they may want to make them out for grandpa and grandma. They may want to make them out for their neighbor. They may want to make them out for anything else. You know, dead batteries all around. See what happens when you're gone for a week? Just, it just uh, goes to nothing. I'm just going to yell at you again today. Hope you're okay with that. The uh, coupon books are going to be a lot of fun. They're going to learn about kindness, random acts of kindness. And uh, I hope we can talk in here today about some of the same things. Um, there's a misprint or bulletin. If you've gone to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, you are wrong. But don't close the Bible. Because we're actually going to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Just missed a little 9 there. It's actually chapter 4, verse 29 through 32. is going to be our main scripture. But I will back up and read from chapter 17. Or not chapter, verse 17. But let's just start with verse 29 and read through verse 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, anger, sorry, bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Amen? Amen. I love the, the sign out there that we, that we changed for this, this week that says, uh, uh, be kind and forgiving, God said so. Okay? God said it through Paul. Okay? God said it. Are you kind? I think most of us in here, if, I, if, if, if we were to go around the room and say, is so-and-so kind? I think most of us would probably say yes about everybody. Uh, are you forgiving? That may be another story. And again, we go around in this room, we may get all yeses. But what if I go and ask all of your coworkers? What if I go and ask the person you buy your groceries from? What if I go and ask doctor or the receptionist at your doctor? What if I asked that person if you were kind and forgiving? It might be a different story when we deal with people that are not inside the church. And as we have talked all these last few weeks about the fruit of the Spirit, the biggest thing about this fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us, and the Holy Spirit is inside of us, and He works these things out, these nine attributes. He's bringing them out of us more and more and more. The way that we see these attributes is in relationships with other people. Now most of us, maybe not all of us, it hasn't been this way throughout all the course of history with every person in the world, we usually get along with the people we go to church with. Not always. But my focus today is on the people outside of the church. Are you kind and are you forgiving to them? Huge difference. And I, I, I'll just use my own life as an example. Um, I was probably 24, 25 years old. And uh, I was the, the, the youth leader at my church uh, in Des Moines at that point. And uh, things were going, going really well. Kids were having a great time. We were doing all kinds of activities all over the place on the, on, in the state of Iowa, quizzing and camps and, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of fun. This other guy comes into the church about a year before, and he and his wife have four kids, and they're getting involved. He's probably mid-30s at that point, so 10 or more years older than me um, at that point. He comes in, and he's coming from a, a, a Presbyterian church, Background. He had gone away from church for a while, comes into the church. And he wants to get involved in youth ministry. Well, I'm the youth leader at the church. 
So you can help me if you want. And he was fine with that. But I was so threatened. I was so threatened. And so then it came time for, we just, we, we, we haven't done this in, in our church since I've been here, but every May 31st, the end of the church year, there's typically with the church not like ours, but there, there's voting that goes on uh, to determine who's going to be the leaders in the church for the upcoming church year. And, and they, we had the nominating committee and everything, and, and usually what happens is someone already holds a position, like I did, of NYI president. Um, they get put onto this ballot, yes or no. Yes or no. So this guy comes in, and, and he's, making, he's friends with everybody, everybody likes him, it's going great. And uh, this other person, who's, who's definitely my friend now, at the time I was very angry at him. Uh, he said, well, why don't, we, uh, why don't we put this guy's name on there? For NYI director. And he was a fairly new Nazarene, didn't, you know, didn't know that there was, you know, unwritten rules. I've already got the position. You don't need to, you don't need to put anyone else's name on the ballot. Come on now. And so I'm, 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 I get the information that it's not going to be a yes, no ballot. It's going to be my name versus his name. And now we've got this competition, like in church. And I'm like, I could not have been less kind to that man. Now, I want to give myself a break, uh, and, and my dad didn't, I'll tell you that. Uh, he, I was 25 years old, and uh, man, I was mean to this guy. And not like and not like in his face, like, you're a big loser or anything like that, but I, I mean, I, you talk silent treatment, you talk, uh, he's, he's, you know, playing basketball with somebody, and I just refuse to go play basketball because I don't want to play with him. Um, all kinds, and, and it was just so visible to everybody that I was being the biggest tool bag in the world, right? And I, it's so obvious there. And I, at the time, I was like, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just giving him space. I'm just fine. And I was, I was a jerk. I was not kind. Um, and he had no clue why I was angry, right? He had no clue at all. And uh, my dad. <laughs> I don't think I don't know if they, I'm sure there's been a 25 year old who's gotten like an actual spanking from their parents. Um, my dad did not give me a spanking, but he threatened uh, at 25 years old. And, I, and I'm, I'm bigger than my dad. I was bigger than him at that time. But he was so mad at me. You are on the board of this church. You are a leader in this church. These kids are looking at you to see how to respond in this situation. And no, you don't have to be happy about it. You can talk to the pastor about it. You can talk to this other guy about it. Figure out how to work together on this thing. <laughs> but if you keep acting like this, I'm going to whoop you. And, uh, wow. I mean, I, I, my dad, and my dad's whooped me before, so I know what that's like. Um, but it took me, it took him telling me that to... So there's this, this, this friction, because while I wasn't being inherently mean, I wasn't calling him names, I wasn't talking about him behind his back, I wasn't, you know, wasn't slashing his tires out in the parking lot or anything like that, I was not being kind. And it was visible. So while kindness does not always get noticed, un- Kindness, is that a word? I don't know. It does get noticed. When you are unkind, when you are not kind to somebody, it gets noticed no matter how much you want to put that behind you or how much you want to say, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm just ignoring them. It's noticed. I put a, a thing out on Facebook this morning. Um, I came across this as I was studying this week. It says, Kindness is grace expressed in human relationships by being helpful or beneficial when anger, jealousy, or hatred might be the expected natural response. Kindness happens when you don't want to be kind. The Bible says, how hard is it to love somebody when they're nice to you? It's not hard at all. Not hard at all. But, when someone doesn't deserve kindness, it's hard to be kind. Now that, with my story, 
kind of flip-flops because that man was so kind to me. He, we've, we've talked about this since, I'm friends with him now, um, and we, we, we stayed friends with the whole thing. It was, it was literally like a two-week thing where I was in church. Um, but like, so, so the, the whole thing went down, we figured out a way to work together, and you know, it was awesome. Everything worked out. We, just, we got together, we talked, and we, because he was kind to me when I didn't deserve kindness. I didn't deserve to be treated with a level of respect that says, you're a child of God, I'm going to love you no matter what. But he, in his wisdom, you know what, what blows my mind is he was probably 35 at that time. And now I'm pushing 35. And I thought he was so old. I thought, well, when I, I thought man, when I'm that old, I'm not going to want to be around teenagers. I around teenagers way too much. Uh, but I love them because God loves them. And once... Good things to happen. So, uh, he was so kind to me. He was forgiving of me. He saw what was going on. We talked later. He said, I, I know you're struggling with that. I know you. I know that God was working on you. And he took a, a, a position of maturity and wisdom and said, I'm going to love you. No matter what. And through that love, I was able to be brought back through that love and the fear of my dad. And we talked about the fear of God in Sunday school this morning. Uh, <laughs> The fear of God causes you to not sin, and that's what they told the Israelites in Exodus. Uh, the fear of my dad caused me to shape up, and I was just, anyways, uh, it, was, it was so good. But Rachel asked me a question last night, we were talking about the sermon today and what she was going to do back there, and she just asked me a question, does kindness come only when someone doesn't deserve it? If I'm going to be kind to somebody who's who deserves it, you know, a nice neighbor lady who, who can't mow her yard, mow her yard, that's kind. But how easy is it to be kind with someone's kindness? Real, deep, Jesus Christ kind of kindness comes when someone does not deserve it. When someone acts in such a way that you want to by the shoulders and shaking as hard as can. It's a get with the program, dude. Figure it out. You're messing everything up. And when they hear that, when you respond in that way rather than in kindness, you set them on a course that says, that dude doesn't like me. That dude doesn't love me. He just wants, he wants me to get my act together so we can enjoy his life better. But when we love and are kind and forgiving, when we don't have to be by the world's standards, that's when Jesus stands take over. And the world sees that. The world sees when we are kind to those who don't deserve to be rewarded kindness. And I said, we're going to back up, but I want to read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 on if your Bible's like mine, you've got headings um, above this passage. So above verse 17, it says, Instructions for Christian living. If I'm going to be a Christian and I'm going to live a Christian life, it seems like a pretty good section of Scripture that I should pay attention to. Instructions for Christian living. Paul tells us, So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. He insists that these Ephesians that he's writing to in us today... Pay attention to this, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Gentiles at that time, he was talking to Gentiles, the Ephesians were Gentiles, but he was talking to Gentile believers who had come to the, that time, Jewish faith in, 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 uh, in, in Christ. Um, or the faith in Jesus Christ. Mostly Jews at the time. So they were, they were, he was talking to people who had been Gentiles, transitioning through a lot of different things, but following the, the Jewish laws and customs at that time. And so he says, you are not to think, not to live like the Gentiles before who were not Jesus followers, okay? So think of the world today, they're not Jesus followers. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Okay? Think of the world around us today. That describes them very, very well. Those who are not following Jesus Christ. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. 
and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Big stuff there. When you come to know Jesus Christ, there is stuff to learn, right? We start to change. We start to say, okay, what's in here? Let me do that. That's what it means to come to know Jesus Christ and then to learn what it is to live in Jesus Christ. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. You were taught what, what all this was over here, your former way of life. You were taught what that really was. To put off your old self, get rid of the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Think of your old life before you came to know Jesus Christ. Things that you wanted in this world. And in the They make you want things that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and with God. And it takes you out of the center of His will. And it can destroy your life. Your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Ooh. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. It starts up here, right? We choose, we choose to follow Jesus Christ, we choose to learn the ways of Jesus Christ, and to then follow what He says. We can't just say, okay, I don't like what's happening over here in my whole life, I know I need to change, I know I need to get straightened out, I know I need to figure this thing out, oh, this Jesus thing, He's come to save me, forgive me of my sins, okay, Jesus Christ, save, thank you for dying on the cross, save me of my sins. Hey, how's it going? I'm having a drink later. You want to come out to the bar with me? No. We choose to change. We choose to be changed by Jesus Christ in our minds. Because He is not going to just remove all of the old desires that we have. He's not just going to remove all the temptation in this world. He's not going to just make you do the right things because then... We're robots, we've lost our free will, and what's the point again? We have a free will, even after we choose Jesus Christ, we have a free will to then choose Him, to choose what He teaches us, what He has told us already, and to accept His grace. We've got to make that mental choice to act in accordance with this new way of life. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness, and holiness. We can be holy. Amen? Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Okay, we've got to. This is what he's telling them about their old self, new self, all this stuff. This is information you should know. And now here we come to some instructions. Therefore, each of you put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Is it possible to go through life without having a bout of anger? Without being angry about something? It's not possible. We're going to be angry at different things in our lives. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. That whole verse of do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, a lot of husbands and wives use that. Don't go to sleep while you're still angry. We're not going to... Do that, Rich and I talked about that. We have a, a sign that it's supposed to be up on our wall in our bedroom, but you know we still haven't really moved in. <laughs> we don't have much decorations on our walls. Uh, it's been a year and a half, but that's okay. Um, it says, now I can get you down here, so I can't think exactly what it says. But it says, uh, I can't remember. But it's something along those lines, okay? Something about kiss me, kiss me good night. But it has to do with that. <laughs> Don't let her see this word. Okay. Um, you know that single down where you're still angry? Do you guys know? So there's this passage in Matthew. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it says if you have, if someone has something against you, and you come to the altar and you, oh man, I messed up. I did something wrong with someone. It's just to leave your gift at the altar. You go. Be reconciled with that person. Say the same thing. Don't live your life if someone has something, if you've done something to somebody else. Don't continue just to live your life in the same way. Don't make things right. To the best of your ability, live at peace with one another. It's 
to the Bible too. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. It's not just some cute, cliche thing that the world is made of. That's a biblical Jesus truth. Make things right with people. Don't be angry. And do not let the devil give you a foothold. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. It's a good lesson for life. What are you doing to share with those in need? Verse 29, again. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building other people according to their needs. Not according to my needs, not according to my family's needs, according to their needs. Do not let any unsolved from talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building somebody up according to what they need. Let it be a benefit those who listen. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You guys don't want to be grieve the Holy Spirit? I think we've talked about this once or twice before. Holy Spirit, which lives inside of you, if you have accepted Him inside of you, will be grieved when you act in a way that is listed out in the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, that wants to take you from a place of despair and sorrow and separation from God, He wants to take you from over there and put you in a place where you can stand in the midst of God and say, Father, I love you. Please love me. And the Holy Spirit is grieved when your heart is full of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every other form of malice. Bitterness is big. We hold grudges as human beings. We hold grudges a lot. And that's, that's bitterness. To be bitter, hold a grudge. Whether you're holding a grudge against Parent, sibling, co-worker, neighbor, uh, God. You hold the grudge against God. It's tough because we have we have what we know we need and what we what we want in this world. And when it doesn't happen, it's tough. But God has a plan to restore you from that. Get rid of that bitterness. Rage, anger, brawling, slander, every form of madness. Brawling one, that's what I had to deal with when I was a teenager in, in the 20s. I wanted to fight with every person I came in the fifth degree. Christian fighting, man, this is righteous. I believe in God. And this, you're talking bad about my God, and I'm, I'm going. Come on, let's do this. And my, my dad was a... Uh, not an angry man, but uh, he was abused as a child uh, by his stepdad for about 12 years. Uh, horribly abused. And I'm just, uh, everything that I've learned about people who were abused as a child and what kind of parents they become themselves, to know what God did in my dad's heart, to take him from someone who went through all that, to how he raised me and my siblings. Uh, that he had his moments of uh, temper, um, and that got passed on to me. I've, 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 I've had moments of, of a lot of uh, rage in my life. But it's when I was younger, and God did a work in me. I, I, I specifically remember the day where I said, God, I, got, I can't do this. I'm not going to win anybody to you. So I'm full of anger. I'm full of, well, even if I'm going to fight in your name. God's not going to honor them. He wants you to love. He wants us to be kind. To be, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The people that you are not kind to. Okay, I want you to just picture someone in your mind. We're going to close here in just a couple minutes. The people that you are not kind to. Why 
are you not kind to me? Just answer it yourself. People that you are not kind to, why? More than likely it's because they've done something to you, against you, or something that you love. Um, maybe they lack a lot of common sense, so you don't have much patience for that. Maybe they're really bad drivers. Whoever you are not kind to, God says to forgive them. Just as in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. None of us truly deserve the kindness of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. But He's given it to us anyways. Even though we've hurt Him and said no to Him so many times, we don't deserve the grace that He has given us. But He has given it to us. And He has called us all to give that same grace and forgiveness and kindness to those who don't deserve it in our lives. And in doing so, we may, we may just reach one more person for Jesus Christ because of how much we love the world, how well we love the world around us, even when they don't deserve it. Amen? I've really enjoyed this, this, this take of communion every time we've done a Let It Be Fruit of the Spirit um, lessons. And as I said, Fruit of the Spirit, when the, these attributes are played out in our lives, it's all about relationships. Proper relationships is all about unity, being together in one accord. And communion is an act of unity between believers in Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there are people in here who, who may not be comfortable with communion. Um, people that have talked to me personally about it, uh, don't feel like you have to take it to be a part of this service, to be a part of what God is doing here. Um, but I also want you to feel free to take communion. If you are right with God, if you have asked for the forgiveness of your sins, and you say, I want to be a part of something bigger, take this communion. Make sure you're right with God. If there's anybody that said that, uh, that you have wronged, go to them. Ask for forgiveness. Take communion. Communion is a great act of unity. Amen. Let's pray, and then I'll have you guys each come forward. Uh, grab, grab, I'm trying to do it a different way each time. Uh, come forward, grab your, your cup and your uh, uh, wafer. If you need to stop and pray for a moment or longer, that's fine. But go ahead and don't, don't take the, the drink in the way for you have to go ahead and go back to your spot. And then when everyone is back at their spots, we'll take it together as an act of unity. You build a few places. Feel the stay together and just as you feel led, come forward.